Okay, Tom, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Lou, and thanks to everyone who is here with us in the room and in Zoom land that uh, this is the seventh in the 2024 Great Decision Series. And once again, we have a very interesting and important topic and I think a terrific speaker. Rob Dunbar is a colleague at Stanford who's been directing ocean programs for several decades now at, at Stanford. He also has worked on ocean topics for the United Nations uh, and for special projects under the Law of the Sea uh, Convention, that the title in the workbook is the High Seas Treaty. But uh, I've asked Rob to tell us what he thinks are the most interesting things to share about the challenges that have involve the ocean, but affect all of us, uh, affect all life. And he is recently back from a trip to Antarctica. So if you have questions about Antarctic uh, questions, please put them into the questions. And I do not wish to take any more of Rob's time. So thank you, my friends, for being here. Yeah. We look forward to this. <laughs> thanks, Tom. And thanks, Scott, for all you did to put this together. It's an amazing production. I, I'll stay seated here and on camera for just a few minutes, and then I'll minimize the, um, you know, the little pictures there once we go to the slides. But I did want to say thank you for having me. Um, you know, this actually means quite a lot. My parents were doing great decisions for, well, they started, I think, in the, it would have been probably 82, 83, right? And um, so they were involved heavily in Southern California and Fallbrook. When my dad retired, they started uh, growing avocados and were heavily involved in rudery and great decisions and all of that. So I've read a lot of the materials that my parents were going over and I read what you had provided on High Seas Treaty, so super excited to be here. Happy to be here with my long, long-term friend, Alan Cooper, as well. And he's brought me to this church before. Um, Alan and I are colleagues in Antarctic research and teaching. We teach some classes together at Stanford. And he probably knows more about the UN Convention on Law of the Sea than I do. So if he doesn't mind, I may defer questions to him. But let's go ahead and get started. I'll stand up. Um, now, my, my email address is on this first slide, and I always respond to emails. I give a lot of public talks uh, around the world, and, um, and if, you, if you want copies of all of the slides or references that you've heard me talk about, uh, just shoot me a note, and I will reply. It may be super short if I'm getting a bunch of emails in, but I will get back to you. So that's a, a big part of what I do is, is stay in touch with people. Okay, so I'm going to start out with a really short introduction about who I am, things that I work on, um, kind of bipolar, work north and south. Um, but I also work in the tropics. The students in my lab call it fire and ice, because many of them get to go spend a couple of years in Antarctica and then warm up in the equatorial Pacific and that sort of thing. I've been working on science to policy. So I was engaged by the UN Foundation about 22 years ago to support the small island and developing states. And along the way, um, I helped write uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is the oceans one that's referred to in the New High Seas Treaty. Um, I'm also um, working for the International Atomic Energy Agency. We all have, um, I'm an isotope chemist, right? That's one of the ways I study Earth. And we have these t-shirts that say, isotopes for peace, you know? It's not all about bombs and energy. And I've been doing that uh, for 19 years now, mostly in small nations in the Western Pacific, but I've also run workshops for students from Syria and Iran and Egypt, Jordan, Middle East countries to kind of help them understand that it's not all about bombs and power, that there's many medical uses for isotopes. And then what I do is environmental 
um, kind of crime scene identification, right? If there's been some damage, how can we understand how it was caused? And maybe there's a pathway out then. So uh, people in the lab that are responsible for some of these things, in a general sense, I study climate change on planet Earth, but I do this by working in the ocean. And all of this here is to scale the volume of the dry earth, right? That size. And then if you look at seawater, it would be a sphere that big. And then all the fresh water on earth is that tiny little uh, pea there. Um, and even though the liquid water on the planet is a pretty small part of the overall planet, it's everything for climate change, right? So the oceans absorb the heat of global warming, it's heat exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean that drives all of our weather, rain, heat transport to the poles. And it's also true that because the oceans hold so much carbon dioxide, it dissolves in the oceans very easily that this, I'm convinced that this is going to be um, one of the ways that we get out of the bind we're in now with warming, that we're going to end up putting a lot of CO2 in the ocean. And it, if we increase the dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean by only 1%, you know, we kind of go back to where the atmosphere was before the industrial revolution. So that's a that's a new thing that I'm doing in my lab. Places that I've worked and published papers, um, you can see mainly the Pacific, but then the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic, it, it's well, in one sense, tis but a puddle, you know, it just it's not as big a player in the global climate system as the Pacific. Done a lot of work in Antarctica. And then some of these um, transects here, equator, pole equator, and then a uh, whole series of sites here across the central Pacific. Uh, these are places where we've studied the expansion and contraction of the warmest water on the planet, which is one of the prime drivers of global circulation. So uh, I take students to Antarctica. I've taken about 120 students to Antarctica since 1982. Um, Robin and I have ventured together initially in 82, I guess. And then we just got back in February from a trip to Antarctica. This is sea ice, by the way. The ocean there is about 1,200 meters deep. The ice is about four meters thick. And we're studying organisms that live within the ice. That's another story. <laughs> and we still study the ice, but now we go out on big icebreakers that can take us pretty much wherever we want to go. So I've spent... Uh, I don't know, three or four years of my life living and working on that ship. And whenever I can, I take uh, people, students with me. I own my own boat. This is uh, well, it's a Stanford owned boat. You never want to own a boat yourself if you can get somebody else to own it, right? I mean, so I owned it for about two minutes and then I transferred title over to Stanford. Uh, but it's a little research vessel, purpose built to do geology and geophysics and water column sampling and and there we are in Torres del Paine. I'm trying to move this boat up to um, Monterey Bay. And maybe some of you guys will volunteer to come out, right? Any sailors here? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then teaching. I do a lot of teaching overseas. And one of my focal pedagogies is looking at how the human enterprise intersects with nature. And I'm attracted to the really pristine, raw parts of the planet and Antarctica, Patagonia, the Himalayas. And um, so I'm teaching a class now called Stanford at Sea. We're gonna head out to Papiete, Tahiti, um, one month from today, May 7th, and uh, sail about 3,000 miles with uh, 21 students doing science along the way. So I do a lot of field observing, and then we bring samples back to the lab. But that's the ship that will be on Stanford at Sea. It's the Robert C. Siemens, named after the Secretary of the Navy, 120 feet. And uh, that's in Morea Harbor. Um, excellent platform for doing science in the high seas, right? OK, so now we're going to launch on the main topic, right? We're talking about the oceans and ways to protect it, manage it, extract resources from it. That's what the High Seas Treaty is about. But as Tom said, you know, I have I was given freedom to talk about things that I thought were important that I thought you might want to know. So we'll start with a few of those. What's going on? So you probably know now that 
2023 was a huge step up in global average temperature. It was the warmest year on record, and not just by a little bit. It was the single largest year on jump in global temperatures. And a lot of that was driven by um, unbelievable accumulation of heat in the ocean. So this goes back to 1880. You can't quite read it there. 1880 to, to 2023. And the planets warmed up a little bit over one and a half degrees in the last century, right? So where does that heat go? So most of the heat of global warming, right, from man-made effects, uh, most of that heat's in the ocean already. And it's a good thing, right? Many parts of the planet wouldn't be habitable if that heat had not been absorbed by the ocean. And when this figure was done, um, maybe seven years ago, at that point, we estimated that 93% of all of the heat of global warming was in the ocean. And that's because water has this high heat capacity. There's, here's land and sea ice melting, it's only 2%. The atmosphere is warmer, but that's only 2% of all of the excess heat. Likewise, the land surface around 2%. So if you really want to take the pulse of the planet and take the temperature of the planet, you don't do it on land. You don't do it in the atmosphere. You do it in the ocean because that's where heat always gets stored, right? And so we've had a lot of people working on this. So in 2024, we've had about five papers out now that say it's more than 96% of all of the heat of global warmings in the ocean. So the ocean's getting hotter and that has impacts on, on many things, life in the ocean, but also as it gets hotter, it's able to take up a little bit less heat from the atmosphere. And you can think about this in energetic terms, you know, I bet more than one of you comes from a science or an engineering background. So we've got this global fleet of robots in the ocean now. They're going up and down in the water column every 10 days. They've been doing this work for 30 years now. Over 7,000 of these robots just measuring the temperature throughout the upper 2,000 meters. Some of them go down now to 6,000 meters. And every 10 days, they send the temperature of the ocean interior. They send that data back to servers in the U.S. And then we we integrate it, we calculate the heat content, and, and, and these are huge units, right? So what's happening is, you know, the ocean heat storage is increasing by 10 to 12 zeta joules per year. And a zeta joule is 10 to the 21st joules, right? So it's a really big number. And um, we've had some years where the heat content increased by 16 or even 18 zeta joules. And just to put that in context, if you add up the energy production by every single power plant on Earth and the energy produced in all combustion engines, trucks, cars, airplanes, whatever, you know, it, it, this is the number. It's half of a schedule, right? <laughs> so, you know, we're the oceans are accumulating 20 to 30 times as much energy as heat in the ocean compared to all energy for every activity of mankind, right? That's the scale of this warming <laughs> in the place that warms the most. So um, sea levels rising. So our sun, much to our chagrin, this is my wife Robin here, our sun moved to Galway, Ireland, what, six years ago? Yeah. And then we, we were afraid, oh, he's going to marry an Irish girl and never move back to California. And sure enough, he married an American woman that's a professor of physics there. And we have our first two grandchildren now. So uh, we noticed this display, uh, an art display illustrating 1.6 meters of sea level rise in downtown Galway. Um, pretty striking. And these are all over the place in Europe now, right? They're just trying to get people to understand what is 1.6 meters mean. And we're gonna be there before the end of this century. I might not be, but, but the planet will experience that. And there's another one on a house. I think it would be kind of annoying at night, you know, to have all that light coming in. But if you drive by it, it's really quite effective where we expect sea level to be later this century because of warming of the ocean, melting of the ice sheets. And then uh, I do a lot of work on ocean acidification as well. I'm not gonna spend much time on that today, but it's easily measured 
we're seeing impacts already on marine life, on fisheries yields and that sort of thing. So there's, you know, four or five things going on in the ocean that are pretty significant. But now we're getting to the article that you guys read. Did everybody read the article? I read it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's what I do that in my, in my classes. I give them reading assignments. And the very next day I say, who read the reading assignment? And, you know, like three people put their hands up. And then I say, it's going to be on the exam. And then they'll probably go back and read it. But we're, I've got a number of slides here to talk about this. There's some word slides that look kind of boring, but they're up there is an outline for me to explain to you what's going on with this current treaty, which is in a very, it's kind of in a delicate position at the moment. But we need it because it governs what happens in the light blue area here, right? So all of the dark blue areas, those are, those are exclusive economic zones of countries. Um, I'm not sure why they did it for Antarctica because no country owns Antarctica. So that's kind of a mistake, but, but everywhere else, the exclusive economic zone is associated with an adjacent nation, but everything in light blue is high seas, right? It's about two thirds of the ocean and most of the deep water areas. And, you know, there's a lot of definitions that go into this. I think everybody knows that we have territorial seas where we control everything, 12 nautical miles. Uh, many states have state controlled waters out to three nautical miles, right? Alaska, for example, has totally different fisheries management in the closest three miles compared to the federally controlled 12 miles. Um, then there's this exclusive economic zone that extends out 200 kilometers away from uh, they call it baseline, but really it's where is sea level, right? So if you come out 200 kilometers, that or I'm sorry, nautical miles, nautical miles, not kilometers, you come out, that's the end of the exclusive economic zone. But under the UN uh, Convention on Law of the Sea, if your continental margin, your continental crustal material uh, extends further out of the ocean, you can make an application for an extended claim. And a number of nations have done that. Uh, Australia and Antarctica, Russia claims half of the Arctic on the basis of their, their extended continental margin claim, but it's been challenged by Denmark and Greenland, right? So um, it's a little bit different for airspace, but once you get out clearly away from the economic zone and some extended claims, then you're very much in the high seas, right? So, um, this is them, 64% of the Earth's, uh, Earth's ocean, 45% of the total surface of the Earth is not under national jurisdiction. And that's why we have constructs like the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, but also the High Seas Treaty. One of the things that we most often think about is resource use, right? We're trying to avoid tragedy of the commons. It's it's where everybody realizes it's a limited resource and they want to, you know, they want to get their part of it before anybody else does or before it's all gone, right? It's like gold rush thinking in Alaska. And these are the countries that are currently doing the most fishing. You can probably Spain and Japan and China, uh, Russia, Chile, US, Korea, um, major fishing nations. So this is the High Seas Treaty, kind of the, the status. Um, this quote, ladies and gentlemen, the ship has reached the shore. You know, that was a quote recorded less than a month ago um, by Rena Lee, uh, who's currently the chair of the main conference of the parties that are negotiating this thing. And these conferences started 20 years ago. That's when enough nations said, hey, you know, we've got to manage the high seas region or some countries are going to take advantage of it. The technologically advanced countries that have big ships and can do deep sea mining giant nets to catch fish, they're going to get everything. <laughs> and so the conferences began in 2004. It took a long time, but the most recent uh, kind of the, the current form was agreed upon in 2023 countries could start signing it in September 2023 and 88, as of today, 88 countries have signed 
this high seas treaty. So biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And so ratification was possible in 2024. And you got, you probably know this already, like nations sign treaties, but they don't come into effect until a minimum number of national governments have actually ratified the treaty. So the US signed the UN Convention on Law of the Sea in the early 80s, but the Senate has never ratified it. Right? We're one of the few nations that has never ratified law of the sea. We can talk about that later. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, so ratification opened in 2024. And as of today, the two countries that have ratified it, it's Chile and the Republic of Palau, which is a place I do a lot of work. So go Palau. <laughs> they were the first to the ratification table um, right away. So what, what we need is 60. So once 60 nations have ratified out of the 194, um, then it starts a 120-day clock. And at the end of that clock, that's when all the provisions go into effect. And it actually affects international law. So it creates internationally uh, legally binding um, instruments to do a bunch of things. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and it is viewed as a pretty key step um, towards getting to 30% protection by the year 2030. We're not gonna make it, we already know that, right? But that was the UN goal laid out about 15 years ago now to protect 30% of the land and protect 30% of the ocean by the year 2030. But in both environments, we're way behind. It's very difficult to do, easy to say it, but very difficult to do it. Okay, so what does it do? So there's five main things, you know, the High Seas Treaty, they call it BBNJ, um, beyond, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. And, and if you search on Google News, BBNJ, you'll come up with hundreds of hits on this thing. But there's five main things, and one's a big expansion in uh, protection beyond borders. And that means the creation of new high seas marine protected areas. Right now, only about 1% of the ICs are protected through some, you know, setting boundaries and having guidelines on who can enter, if people can fish or not, mixed use usually, but only 1% has any form of protection. And then uh, making the oceans cleaner, reducing pollution, including plastics, um, having um, legally binding rules, right, about ocean dumping. We have some already, but this will put a lot more teeth into ocean dumping regulations in high seas water, sustainably managing fish stocks. This, this will greatly expand the port state measures agreement that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, lowering temperatures. Actually, I, I, I read this thing and I don't see anything in there that's gonna lower temperatures, but they put it in anyway. Um, I think, you know, increasing resilience, yes. The, this um, treaty makes an argument for increased um, ecosystem-based management where if you're extracting resources or managing an open water ecosystem that you make sure you don't lose some of the key pieces or guilds of organisms that are critical to making that ecosystem operate. And and the theory is that that will increase resilience to climate change. And then um, the last one, again, vital, vital for realizing the 2030 agenda. I, I agree it's vital, but it's too late. We're not going to make 30% by 2030. It's impossible. Um, so sustainable development goal 14, you know, I, I helped write that. Um, and my opinion about all of the sustainable development goals is that there's a lot of them and there's only one for the ocean and the ocean is 71% of our planet. I, I mean, I think we missed a chance to break it out into different categories of sustainable development and therefore focus more attention, you know? So I was kind of appalled actually, because we had started with three and we ended up with one, right? Um, and then at the bottom there, this is super important. So, you know, the hope is that 60 countries will ratify this thing 
by sometime in 2025, and then it comes into effect. But the problem is the details haven't been worked out. Like what will be the legal instruments? What will be the penalties? Who's gonna pay for enforcement for fi better fisheries patrolling? You know, how's that going to be done? Is it going to be done entirely with satellites? Do we use drones? You know, are we going to sink illegal fishing boats? Like none of, you know, that was left for later. But I think you would argue that those details are some of the hardest things for anybody to figure out, right? So um, that's a bit of a problem, but uh, that's how these things go. So I wanted to make a couple of points here, then I'll show you some pictures and we'll talk a little bit about the Antarctic example. Um, but nearly all governance in the high seas areas kind of emanates or, or has evolved from the 1982 UN Convention on Law of the Sea. And one of the reasons that the US didn't sign it or didn't, well, they signed it, they didn't ratify it because you know, one nation can hold another nation legally liable for harm that they uh, have experienced uh, due to a contravention of, you know, something in the Law of the Sea Treaty, let's say pollution. And I was involved um, when I was supporting the, the SIDS nations through the UN Foundation. We created a hypothetical lawsuit. And the lawsuit was... Um, against the nation of Canada because they're super high per capita emitters of carbon dioxide, right? And it was on behalf of the atoll nations of the Pacific where if sea level rises, you know, half a meter, like they lose a third of their land. And if it rises two meters, they don't have any more nation. That's the case for Kiribati. And, and the notion, you know, this thing, it was possible because Canada's CO2 emissions could be linked to the melting of ice in Greenland and Antarctica that was causing sea level to rise. And so I was on the science side. I'm not a lawyer, but we had some really good lawyers and we prepared this, you know, 120 page document not to file it in an international court, but to send to the government of Canada to let them know that since you signed this thing, right, UNCLOS and all these Pacific nations also signed it. You know, this is exactly what's going to happen. They're allowed to do it and you'll be found guilty. That's the reason the U.S. didn't sign at that time because of liability issues viewed as the world's largest emitter of, of CO2 and other pollutants going into the ocean. Um, and that was true throughout the 80s and 90s and first decade of 2000. So, uh, but this current high seas treaty, it doesn't exist in isolation. There's these other things, the International Seabed Authority that governs deep sea mining, right? And other activities that impact the seabed. And that's gonna intersect with the high seas treaty in ways that, that we don't know how it's gonna work out yet, but there'll be some authority conflicts there. Port state measures that was done with the Food and Agricultural Organization in 2009. And I'll just point out, you know, before the High Seas Treaty, this was the single most important treaty governing um, food resources coming from the high seas. It was signed in 2009. It took seven years to ratify it, right? Seven years. So the argument could be made that we shouldn't expect to see the High Seas Treaty fully ratified until you know, the end of this decade. I think it's quite hopeful to imagine that it's going to be 2025. Okay, um, so a little bit about port state measures. So this agreement um, is pretty cool because it's all about ports in various states, right? And it's pretty simple, like ships that want to come in and land their catch and transship their catch to other nations there's a list of about 12 things that they have to provide to the port authorities. And if they can't do that, they're not allowed to stop there and offload their fish. In some cases, they can't even refuel their vessel. So what are those things? Um, it's, uh, that's the list there. They have to have appropriate gear types and some kind of fishing authorization from a national entity. They can't be stateless illegal fishers. And those guys are everywhere in the ocean now. Um, they have to provide information about transshipment. They have to carry 
automatic identification systems on the vessel that can be tracked by satellite 24 seven. Um, they have to provide information on the catch on board. And, and it, you know, you can see on the right side, if you don't have those things, then they are denied the use of the port and they can also be prosecuted, um, uh, taken to court, other things that can be done. But if they do all of those things, then it's the green light on the left that they have authorized use of the port or facilities and transshipment. And just to show you how important the, the automatic vessel identification system is, like this is um, kind of eight years worth of signals received from hundreds of thousands of fishing vessels around the planet. And the scale at the bottom, you probably can't quite see, but once you get up into the yellow to white areas, you know, these are, it's like a hundred hours of fishing effort per square kilometer. And the ocean's a big place, right? So you can see the places where people fish. I mean, the Nordic Sea is unbelievable. They're deep denuded of fish now, but the coast of China, very, very heavily fished. The Sea of Okoksk, um, many high seas areas as well. And these openings here, those are the EEZs of island nations, right? That's where the island nations are controlling who can enter their, their area to fish. And there's less fishing because of it. So it just tells us the high seas are being hit exceptionally hard because there's no rules or there were no rules until BBNJ, the High Seas Treaty. And then we're about to dive into the Southern Ocean um, very little fishing has gone on there traditionally, but but because it's one of the last places where you can still get big fish, right? People are hitting it pretty hard right now. There's a lot of geopolitics down there. Okay, so why do we need a unifying high seas treaty? So you don't need to see the details here. You can see there's a bunch of different colors and patterns, and in each one of those is a different regional fisheries management structure that ranges from the Magnuson-Stevens Act the, that set up the U.S. Fishery Councils. There's the North Atlantic Fisheries Council. There's the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Management Committee. Um, you can see all the names there at the bottom, but there are some cases overlapping. Most of them don't have significant authority or ability to monitor and um, enforce anything. So, I mean, it's really a mess, right? Overlapping and uncertain uh, jurisdictions and no enforcement. And then if you think about conservation, you know, there's some of these organisms have at least a partial mandate to conserve stocks, right? Some of them have no mandate. <laughs> you know, their, their job is to help fishermen find fish and the fish will all be gone. They'll be gone. Um, but some of these have a partial conservation mandate. And, and then there's very few, relatively few, that have a primary conservation mandate. So that's, you know, it's maybe a quarter of the high seas areas, probably a little bit less. Um, so that was the state before the high seas treaty was signed. Um, ecosystem management, same kind of thing. If we want to impact the resilience of high seas ecosystems to climate change, we have to know how they work and make sure we don't extract keystone species, right? And very little of that's going on. I mean, actually, it's probably about half the high seas area. I can't say it's being done very well, though. Some of these groups are extremely underfunded in the uh, Pacific, for example. And then this is the, you know, Pew, um, th these are all from a Pew report in 2016, and there's no colors there at all because nobody's doing this. This is like international governance with regulatory authority to enact conservation measures across multiple sectors. So that didn't exist at all, but the high seas treaty is a total game changer. I would say that's its primary raison d'etre, you know, for coming into existence is to allow this for all parts of the high seas. So I'm going to stop there and just see if there's any questions. I do have things to, I was going to give a short example on Antarctica as a possible model 
but I didn't, you know, I know this is meant to be a dialogue. Take Robert's question, but if we can go with the end, you're, you're fine. Okay. Let me do this question. Okay, so I actually have three. Um, the first one is, can you talk about how students um, get to go to Antarctica or these other boats? Um, are they strictly graduate students or do you have undergraduates? And uh, if you could tell us what IUU stands for in the, in the context yep. of fishing. And finally, can you talk about the CO2 in the ocean? Because you, you implied that we should plan to store CO2 in the ocean. But then later on, you pointed out that the, and I don't thoroughly understand this, but as CO2 rises, because I thought CO2 was, you know, carbonate was buffering, but as CO2 rises, the pH of the, the acidity of the oceans yeah. uh, goes up. Those are three great questions. I'll do them backwards. And if I forget one, you can remind me. So the deal with you know, the CO2 going into the ocean, if it just goes in as gaseous CO2, it increases the acidity of the ocean and it causes carbonate organisms like corals on coral reefs to dissolve. But we do know how to convert that carbon dioxide into alkalinity, which raises the pH, right? So it's really it totally dependent on how the CO2 enters the ocean. The problem is right now, it's mostly from... Um, you know, excess industrial CO2 in the atmosphere dissolves into the ocean as gaseous CO2. It becomes aqueous CO2 and it makes the ocean more acidic. It's much harder work to produce alkalinity, but um, I'm, I personally am convinced we're going to be spending hundreds of billions, if not over a trillion dollars within 15 years to make that happen. Let's see. Second question, well, I'll do the, I'll circle back to the first one. So students, um, you know, when I have a cruise where I'm chief scientist, if there's any bunks on the ship, then I'll try to make them available to both undergrads and grad students. And one year I took, we had a 10 week cruise from Tasmania, from Hobart, ended up in Cape Town, went to Antarctica. It, it coincided exactly with Stanford's winter quarter and so we had 11 undergraduates out there and I ran a 16 unit class on climate change in Antarctica. And then let's see the middle, what was the middle one again? Oh yeah, IUU is illegal, um, unregulated and unreported fishing. And sorry, I didn't, when I reviewed these slides and I just put this together today and I thought I got to remember to say what every acronym is. So that's the bane of fisheries managers and and I've been doing a lot of work in the Indian Ocean for the last eight years, Chagos Archipelago. Uh, it's an interesting place to study because when the UN was supervising the return of territory to the original holders, right, away from the colonial powers in Europe and the US. So at that time, Chagos should have gone back to Mauritius, which traditionally had had authority governance. And Britain decided to keep Chagos in part because the U.S. said, hang on, we need an air base in the Indian Ocean. And Diego Garcia is part of, part of the Chagos archipelago. And the U.K. said, yeah, no problem. We'll go in and, you know, there's 5,000 people living there, but we'll just make a move. That's what they did in 1969 to 1971. They, they took everybody off the islands and, and gave them choice. You can either move to London, you know, or live in Mauritius. And they split half and half, but they've never quite gotten over it. And many cases have been filed. The ICJ, International Court of Justice, has ruled three times now that the UK must um, give Chagos back, right? So um, it's a place that we like to go because he, the human impact stopped instantly in 1970. And it's also a place where because of the military base that's there, um, you know, it's heavily patrolled, right? So larger illegal fishing vessels don't come into it. It, it lets us see what an ecosystem looks like with no fishing pressure. But here's the thing, the IUU boats, it's driven by poverty, 
and hunger in South Asia. And so now there's literally tens of thousands of small boats that come in from Sri Lanka, uh, parts of India that are illegally fishing there. And I mean, there's nothing you can do really, right? Um, so to, to me, like I, in eight short years, I've seen the sharks extirpated from the ecosystem because it used to be one of the sharkiest places I could go, but they go there and it's pretty easy to catch these sharks. Um, that's a disaster. And it's not clear how the high seas treaty is gonna impact that. But see, this is an example of loss of resilience because the you know, top predators in these coastal waters, so it's not necessarily high seas, but the top predators are these ecosystem engineers that make everything else, you know, efficient, right? I mean, think about it, you know, a fit athlete versus a couch potato. That's what I am, I think. But um, the sharks keep everybody fit, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, they really do. And they also adjust the relative proportions of smaller fish that the sharks eat that are grazing on algae, grazing on coral. And the, you know, the theory is that these systems have evolved to be finely tuned with certain numbers of different guilds of types of fish and the sharks are the main engineers to make that happen. So I'm predicting a disaster there. And then once it looks really bad, Britain will give it back to Chagos and they'll say, here it is. <laughs> If you see what you can do with it. Um, okay, that was all three. So I'll, I'll just talk 10 minutes or so, because I think the Antarctic case could be a pretty good example for how to proceed. And so, you know, I teach a polar class every year at Stanford. And one of the things that we do is talk about the Antarctic Treaty. I've talked a lot with Fran Ulmer about the U.S. Arctic Commission and um, the Arctic Council and whether we need a treaty like this in the Arctic, I think we do. It's much more difficult there, but it was pretty easy to do this in 1959. And the treaty, it's only six pages long. You can look it up on the web. It's a short six pages. The words are pretty straightforward, but beautifully crafted. It's very moving, actually. You know, it, it's an international treaty that sets an entire continent aside for peace and science. Like we can all get with that program, right? And pretty cool. Um, so it is considered to be very successful and it governs activities south of 60 degrees south. And I won't go through all 10 of these, but there's no military use allowed. Every now and then uh, countries try to put military stuff in there. The US has tried it, the Russia has done it. Iran announced that we're gonna build a military Navy base there but we're still wondering how that's going to work because they don't have any icebreakers. Um, so freedom of scientific investigation. As an American, I can go anywhere and investigate, and any other scientist can as well. Free ex exchange of scientific plans and data. Allen was famous for his efforts to internationalize the open access to a vast suite of geophysical data a long time ago, that started before the Cold War ended, right? I mean, when did when did you start doing that? Yeah, nine, okay, so about the same time then. So, I mean, pretty cool stuff. So territorial claims are put on hold, and there's a lot of countries, almost all of Antarctica's claimed. There's one small wedge, and we could band together and claim it if you want. I'll explain how that works. Nuclear free zone now. So it says applies to land, but not seas. But that's not entirely true because under the auspices of the Antarctic Treaty is a convention on the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources and they control the ocean south of 60. Uh, let's see, we can expect, well, I think I'll stop with that. Um, they do operate with consensus. If you, if you want to make a fundamental change, it's got to be 100%. So you can imagine like Russia, they always say, I object, you know, <laughs> China, I object. It used to be that Ukraine and Russia always voted lockstep. That stopped in 2014, absolutely. <laughs> and now Ukraine always votes with the West. Um, so here are the current claims, the climate nations. I think there's uh, 12 or 13 of them. 
And these are all the wedges. Uh, Norway has a claim that has an undefined boundary. It doesn't quite go to the South Pole. Australia has the single largest claim. New Zealand's here. And there's a small wedge in, well, it doesn't show up in here, but there's a small wedge here that's currently unclaimed. A religious sect from Utah tried to claim it about 12 years ago, but it was turned down by the Antarctic Treaty Organization. So, so, but all of these nations are signatories to the Antarctic Treaty. They're also voting members. They maintain a year-round presence, uh, which allows them to vote. And they agree, as long as the treaty's in force, to not act on any of their claims, right? So no building of cities, no mining, no oil and gas uh, development, that sort of thing. So the main framework for the countries working together is through science, right? And that's what's brought me down there. Robin started doing science down there in 76 or 77. Um, and it's pretty cool. Like I was collaborating with Russians, you know, in the early 80s. It was a blast. I've sailed on Russian ships. Robin's been on a Russian ship. Uh, it was a submarine listening vessel, actually, a Soviet spy vessel. Um, and so we managed the ocean in an office based out of Hobart, Australia, this convention on the conservation of Antarctic marine living and resources, kind of an unfortunate title. Like, would you want to be considered a living resource for someone? I don't know. Um, but those are the, the voting members that have, uh, they signed and then this was ratified by the nations. And so I'm going to talk about a way to protect a high seas region, the Ross Sea Antarctica, because really all of the ocean around Antarctica is high seas because it, it doesn't belong to any one nation, right? It doesn't have an exclusive economic zone like other coastlines do. And so a guy down at Santa Barbara, Halpern, Ben Halpern, um, spent three years of his life trying to come up with an index of human impacts. You know, how do we use the ocean? Freighters, oil production, wind power, fishing, pollution, and, um, and then kind of coded every tiny... A bit of the ocean this way, uh, ranging from very high impacts. You can see the highest impacts are in parts of Asia, off between China and Japan, and then absolutely around the Nordic countries and Europe. Um, those are very high impacts. And then the Southern Ocean tends to have the lowest impacts. And the part of the Southern Ocean that has the lowest of all is the Ross Sea. And that's the place I've worked there a lot you know, kind of every other year since 1982. Alan led one of the first USGS cruises on the, when the USGS had a ship, uh, they went in there to do some exploration. So, you know, you could argue this is a place that really ought to be protected because it's so pristine. And so pretty simple food chains that probably looks complicated, but compared to the rest of the planet, you know, it's really simple here. There aren't that many organisms. The biodiversity is pretty low. It's really cold water. Um, but there's whales. That's the charismatic megafauna or the whales and seals and penguins and orcas, elephant seals, that sort of thing. Um, and that's what we tend to think about. But it all happens because of this extraordinary primary production and simple zooplankton that get eaten by fish and then fuel everything else. It's like a farm on hyperdrive at two degrees below zero, right? I mean, the chemistry, the metabolism that allows hyper productivity below zero degrees centigrade is pretty remarkable, but it happens there. Life evolved to do that. And the two resources that are most commonly extracted now that are under the control of Camelar is krill and then fish. So here's the krill, um, small shrimp-like organisms. How many of you guys take krill oil? Nobody. No wonder you're so healthy. <laughs> the <laughs> krill and then the toothfish here, Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish. Um, so they're little shrimp-like organisms. The biggest swarm of Antarctic krill that's been recorded, this thing was 300 kilometers long, like one swarm of krill. And, and in the swarm, there's like, 
10,000 of these little shrimps in a cubic meter of water, but 300 kilometers long, 50 kilometers wide, and about 200 meters deep, right? And I think it was estimated to contain something like 8% of the living biomass on the entire planet, you know, was in this one swarm. And it got that big because they used to be eaten by the whales, but then the whales got hunted out. So we started seeing mega, mega swarms of krill. And so there is a big fishery. Here's a krill net, pretty large thing, and towed through the water for not very long, maybe 20 minutes. And, and in a big swarm, you know, it just comes up packed up. But krill oil is um, a health uh, supplement, but it's krill powder. It's used as a feed for other animals, chickens and things. Um, it's a pretty big fishery. And the idea was, well, since we killed all the whales, now we can kill, we can capture what the whales used to eat. And that's at odds with the notion that we want to bring the whales back, right? So there's a lot of politics around that. There's a lot of politics around this too. That's an Antarctic toothfish. Um, there's two kinds of toothfish. That you, and you've probably had this. It gets marketed here as Chilean sea bass. It's not really <laughs> from Chile and it's not a sea bass, but... But um, they're pretty toothy fish, and um, there's a big difference. They look pretty similar, but the Patagonian toothfish, you might live 40 to 70 years, and they're fairly fecund. They can start reproducing early and create a lot of juvenile fish. The Antarctic toothfish grows a lot more slowly, and they can be 200 to 400 years old. So if you, if you capture a two and a half meter Antarctic toothfish, yeah, it's multi-centuries, right? And they're not nearly as fecund. They don't reproduce. But that's an Antarctic toothfish on the right for sure. Um, they're quite pricey. Oh, yeah. So I should say uh, some of these slides were prepared by Cassandra Brooks, who is one of my advisees at Stanford. And she went out on the ships to study, you know, the impact of fishing, in this case, legal fishing from New Zealand and Chile on fish stocks, and also to ask questions like, do you, any of you guys know where these fish recruit? Like, have you ever caught a juvenile toothfish? And the answer was no. <laughs> and in fact, we still have never recovered a juvenile Antarctic toothfish on any cruise anywhere. We've recovered juvenile Patagonian toothfish off of Patagonian South Georgia Falklands, but never an Antarctic toothfish. So she got it. And then the last three years of her dissertation at Stanford, she started studying the Antarctic Treaty process, which is what we're gonna to get to in just a second. So Chilean sea bass, Pacalao of the deep, <laughs> I like that one. Um, this spectacular food, and they do a lot of long lining from kind of three to 400 foot long ships. Um, at any one time, there's probably 40, 50 of these large ships out there because it sells for a lot of money, you know? last year up to $100 a pound. And if you come up with a 300 pound Antarctic toothfish and freeze it and get it to Tokyo, you know, it's almost as valuable as a bluefin tuna. And there's a lot more of them, right? So there's tremendous pressure. So that's where people fish. Uh, you can see the different nations. The French are pretty fond in the French sector of Antarctica. Australia does a lot of tooth fishing. New Zealand, Spain, Ukraine, you can see the Ukraine flag there. They used to always go in the field with Russian ships, but that ended as well in 2014, and it's certainly not happening now. But Norway, um, you can see a lot of, there's mainly three areas, East Antarctica, the Ross Sea, and then the Antarctic Peninsula would be the easiest place to fish. But yeah. There are, Excuse me, thanks, Russ Scott. Is the reason there nobody's catching juvenile toothfish is because there aren't enough of the elderly toothfish to mate, so we don't have any? Yeah, I mean, milk? that's one possibility, but the current thinking, so they're not really, they're not seeing a slowdown, you know, in availability of fish, right? So if they go into a new area and set a bunch of long lines, they catch a lot of fish. So it's not, we're, we don't think there's been a really huge decline. We think that they reproduce in areas that we don't know yet. And there are areas that the fishermen haven't fished in. Like that last slide, you know, I mean, the, just as an example, like 
you know, maybe they're all reproducing here and then fanning out this direction and this direction. And the only people that are going to see that are the Koreans. And maybe they did and they don't tell us, right? I mean, there's no observers on these boats. So we think it's more likely to be that. Um, the, um, you know, there's this other thing that's true in um, large fisheries in the open ocean and some coastal areas is this concept of the boff. So pardon this. This is a true fisheries term. It's a big old fat female, right? So big old fat female fish. So fish that are, you know, in the last 10% of an average lifespan and a lot of fish just keep growing. They don't, they're not like us where you hit like, you know, six foot four and then you stop and then you start shrinking. You know, that's where I am. But with fish, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Until something happens to them. But but um, where studies have been done, you know, on genetics, you know, they'll find that 90% um, of all the fish that you might catch came from half a percent of the female population. And that half percent were the boffs, right? Big old fat females. So that's the other element is that they don't catch that many, you know, what would you call them? They're hyper producers of young, right? The, the real egg producers. Um, they don't catch that many. So the, what you want to do is find out where those fish are, the boffs, and then track where the juvenile fish are. And Cassandra is working on some of this stuff. She's written a proposal to actually go to this part of Antarctica and see if there's juvenile toothfish there. Same thing, this part of the margin is very sparsely fished. Um, but how do you manage a fishery if you don't know where they reproduce, right? And what are the factors that allow them to reproduce? So these are some of the fishers, uh, fishing vessels. Um, you know, I've been on, I don't know, 50 cruises down there, 40 cruises, something like that. And we always see these vessels, sometimes large numbers. The pirate vessels, IUU vessels, are the ones that, you know, they see us on radar and they take off. And you can tell that because of their evasion pattern on radar but pretty good sized vessels. So marine protected areas, um, so MPAs, and I'll just say, you know, do MPAs work? Yes, there's a huge scientific um, basis for implementing them. And that's probably the, the most important provision in the high seas treaty is it will allow us to go from 1% to 20% to maybe 30% of MPAs that are legally enforceable in the high seas. So if you compare um, attributes of a fishery inside and outside of MPAs, you get numbers like this. So biomass, right, increases by four and a half times. The density of fish in the MPA increases by 166% an increase in size, an increase in biodiversity or biological rich richness. Um, there have been enough of these studies now that we know that they work and fishermen know that it works. So it's called fishing the line where you know, fishermen will go to the boundary of an MPA and just fish right along the boundary where they're allowed to fish and they always report higher yields. That's the spillover effect from the MPA. So MPAs are good, good for conservation, good for the fishing industry. You know, everybody should ha be happy. Of course, they're not. That's human nature. So let's say, so the Ross Sea, I'll finish up talking here in just a second. But, you know, this is a satellite picture of ocean color of an area of the ocean, the Ross Sea, that's about the size of France. And the green color reflects hyperproductivity. It's microscopic algae, single-celled algae that live in the ocean. So, it, you know, the water temperature there is between zero and minus two, but these algae can grow up to 20 times faster than similar life forms off of our coast, right? It's sunny 24 hours a day. There's a lot of nutrients, right? There's relatively few things that are trying to eat them when they first start to bloom. And so it, it's really the farm is operating on hyperdrive at that point. And of course, that's the base of the food chain, right? So that's where we see zooplankton coming in and fish that eat the zooplankton. It's where we've captured the largest toothfish, and some of them are boffs. Um, and so this was an area, 
Oh yeah, so a little video. I mean, even when it's ice covered, you can see the um, the algae, the brown in that ice is algae that's actually living up inside <laughs> the sea ice itself. And it's a great place to live if you're a plant cell because nobody can eat you, right? Like they're grazing zooplankton or excluded from access into the ice. Um, so, I mean, even when it looks snow covered and sea ice covered like that, there's very significant primary production going on. And then there's a few short months in the summer when the sun is at its highest uh, angle in the sky, a few short months where the open ocean just explodes. And this is it. So there's open water with a little bit of ice on it. Um, we call it it's pancake ice, but there's just loads of algae within the pancakes and between the pancakes. And it's so thick, you know, this is what appears green from space because those are all photosynthetic. They're photopigments that give it that golden color. The main algae there is diatom. They're chrysophytes in the Linnaean sense. And that means golden algae, golden plant. So, um, so and plus there's tons of cool organisms there. It's very rich in life and uh, high abundances, high standing stocks of higher level organisms like orcas and penguins and seals. And, and you know, the seabed is completely covered with, with life as well, right? Because some of this food makes it down to the bottom. So the idea was that this area should be protected. A group of New Zealand and American filmmakers um, produced this show called The Last Ocean. It's a great movie, hour and a half roundabout. You can find it on, I think, Netflix or Hulu, that kind of thing. But it's it talks about, you know, the unique nature of this place, right? The fact that it has the le the the smallest footprint of human activities of any ocean on Earth, and then how we've seen this increase in fishing, but also the development of a plan to protect it. And so um, that movie came out and there was a significant media campaign associated with it. Um, NGOs got involved and literally hundreds of articles were published on the need to protect it. So that went to Camelot, this convention that meets every year in Hobart, Australia. Oops, sorry. Um, that's a, a little demonstration in front of uh, the Camelot thing. So in 2011, um, the US and New Zealand were early leaders in this notion that we wanted to create the world's largest marine protected area, which it is <laughs> today. It was passed in 2016. And just to show you what people talk about, like, you know, everybody's at the table. So here's a New Zealand plan in red. It's bigger than the American plan in blue. Um, and again, the, you know, the size of France right here, right? So this area is like the size of much of Europe. But then here's an area that's not included in the MPA. And that's because the fishermen they had this idea that that's where the fish come from. That's where they reproduce. There was no data on that, but they, they wanted to make sure there was an opening, a donut hole that would continue to supply you know, it's the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? And that was the space for the goose, um, but with almost no scientific information. And so in 2011, that was to stay to play. Individual nations were drawing lines on maps, but, but the people that vote were not voting at that point. And this is what one of these meetings looks like, right? So, you know, the Camelar nations that have signed off on the treaty, and especially the nations that have significant fishing fleets they're all at the uh the first row of tables on all sides and then other nations like singapore the netherlands you know they're a little bit further away they're observers they're keenly interested in camelar and how decisions are made and the geopolitics but they're it's not going to affect their fishing fleets at this time it might in the future that's why they're there so um, it started out once a year. Now it's two to three times a year that this group gets together, most often in Hobart. And there's Cassandra. So she's working on her dissertation there. And she's sitting with some NGO members. You know, this guy's got, got Krill, <laughs> the Southern Ocean Coalition. So a lot of NGOs in the room. And John Kerry has visited multiple times. So he was a um, pretty strong proponent for for protection um, for all the right reasons. 
And um, Obama, uh, he met with Xi to talk about um, Southern Ocean protection with China being one of the major fishing um, nations. And that actually went pretty well, but look at this picture. That says it all, right? <laughs> like Putin, what's not? I mean, Putin, I think they were the second to last nation to sign the MPA into existence. And so, you know, they got isolated after Crimea in 2014, then Ukraine jumped ship and voted with Europe and the US. And then it was really just China and Russia um, trying to, you know, keep this MPA from coming into existence, but they would pay a price if that happened, right? They, it's bad to be in such a small minority. So here's, and I'm very close to the end of this part, but it was adopted in the year 2016. Here's John Kerry with Sergey Lavrov at the kind of the, the final lap trying to get it done. And then here, here's, this is a timeline from 2003 all the way up to 2016. And it shows when different nations signed on to building a new MPA, the largest on earth. So Britain, US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, these were early adopters and allies. Then uh, a lot of nations, Brazil, Chile, Korea, they signed on between 2008 and 2014. And then the last two were China and Russia. And those were the objectors, right? That every year they would raise their hands and say, I object, you can't do this. So it was adopted in 2016. It's more than 2 million square kilometers. It's the largest high seas MPA on earth. 70% um, of it is absolute no take of any kind, right? So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. And we'd like to see things like this form in the rest of the ocean and the rest of the high seas. But what did it took? You know, it took, it took diplomats, it took scientists, conservation organizations, other NPOs, took a pretty significant media uh, campaign, lots of individuals putting in sweat equity and also industrial engagement. You have to have the fishermen involved and especially the fishermen from the poor nations that see that as it could be their only source of protein, right? So they have to be involved. So that's what it looks like in the Southern Ocean. Now these are the protected areas. This one came into existence uh, because it's all British controlled 2009. And then this large Ross MPA. And this is the plan. This is what's been discussed every year since 2016. So eight years now, a big East Antarctic MPA, a giant Wood Elsie MPA and an Antarctic Peninsula MPA. And they haven't even gotten close, right? Like a lot of the fishing nations are saying, hey, we gave you the Ross Sea. Like, don't bother us anymore. We got to fish somewhere. That's what's going on. And it kind of makes sense. How do you get around that? But if you can't get around that for Antarctica, so far away, you know, how are you going to do it for the high seas? So I'm a little bit worried about that element. I'll stop there and we can open it up for discussion questions. I probably talked more than you thought I would, but i um, happy to discuss and curious about what you guys think of trees like this to try to help us work with our international partners on uh, issues of global commons. So we have I'm reluctant. I'm reluctant to halt you, but I think it is a good idea to go to questions uh, and and comments. But before we do that, let's thank you with the pause. Uh, it's appropriate here to a terrific presentation. Lou, oh, yeah. Why don't we do that, let's Lou? See. Yes, I, I have two questions here. Hey, why don't we start with the Zoom land questions and then we'll start, then we'll switch to the room. Okay, Question on the screen. There you are, okay. Show yourselves, people. <laughs> so Rob, how is a treaty written? Does one person start a draft that others then edit or how, what are the logistics around actually writing a treaty? Yeah, so I wasn't around, well, I guess I was five when the Antarctic Treaty came into existence. Um, I have been involved in the 
conference of the parties for the UN Convention on Climate Change. And I've been in the room when sections were written. I think it's a pretty similar process to writing the sustainable development goals in that it, it does take a leader that will craft a skeleton document and, and it's very, very rough. And then it goes around to representatives from all the nations that wanna be at the table. And sometimes everybody wants to be at the table and it's not workable. And then there's mechanisms where um, the Caribbean small island and developing states will designate one person that represents them in the writing. So you might have a writing team of 20 people and believe it or not, I mean, it's not, it's gonna sound really painful, but imagine if I was typing a letter and it was up on the screen and every single one of you could say, I don't like that word. <laughs> your grammar is horrible, you know, where's your punctuation? Like we don't spell, spell it that way in Britain. Um, but that's what happens. And you could spend three hours on a single sentence. And in most of the UN processes, it's consensus. You have to have 100%. So all it takes is one person in the back of the room saying, I can't accept it, delete that sentence. And you might spend the rest of the afternoon trying to convince that person to leave it in. Eventually, you know, whoever's chairing that editing session says, okay, guys, this has to go. We're not getting anywhere. So it can be very painful. That's why short and sweet is better. That's why they, it's an incentive to be um, not very specific about mechanisms, right? To write in generalities because the hangups always happen with implementation that requires specific, you know, we're going to make this committee and we're going to give them this authority and here are the penalties. Um, that's the hard stuff. So yeah, it's pretty complicated. I could never do it full time. I'm not born to be a diplomat. I'm not patient enough. Okay, uh, next we have a two-part question. Part one, what percentage of the Earth's photosynthesis is occurring in the oceans worldwide? Yeah, okay, that, we know that number pretty well, and it's about half, a per, uh, it's half of it, right? So as Alan was telling me, like, everybody take a deep breath. Let it out. That came from the land. And then take another breath came from the ocean, right? So half of our oxygen comes from the ocean. But the difference is that the organisms that produce our oxygen in the ocean are tiny and they only live for a few weeks to a couple of months. Whereas on land, they, they can be pretty big and live for decades, right? So fundamentally different ecosystems. So the follow-on question is, what percentage comes from the Antarctic region? So you told us 50% comes from the oceans. Um, what, how much of that comes from the Antarctic region? Yeah, I'd have to guess like 15% maybe. Although, you know, we do know that the oceans around Antarctica play an outsized role in taking up atmospheric CO2. And that's because they're so productive. So it could be as much as a quarter of all the oceanic production of oxygen. Thank you. Those are the two uh, questions uh, in the Zoom chat. Back to you, Tom. Okay, we'll switch, we'll switch to here. Uh, I have a question while well, people practice raising your hand here. The effects of increased acidity and increased temperature, at what point or has it already affected the viability of particular types of life in the ocean? That, that Living things don't evolve all that fast. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, there's winners and losers. We've studied this enough for long enough now to know that there's some macroalgae, you know, think kelp, but tropical kelp, that they grow faster in warmer water. And what do they do? They're plants, right? So they need CO2. <laughs> so they, they, they do better. It's like having a greenhouse for flowers where you elevate the CO2 levels to help the plant, the flowers grow faster. And that happens in the ocean. So, you know, tropical algae probably enhanced by higher temperatures and higher 
partial pressures of CO2, but things like corals, which we know are temperature sensitive, they're, they struggle a bit when the temperature gets to be 29, 29 and a half degrees centigrade, but then they, and then they just die at 30. If the water becomes a little bit more acidic, you know, that's another stressor. If the water becomes a little bit more polluted, that's another stressor. And these things accumulate and, it, you know, they'll die sooner, they'll bleach sooner um, with um, interacting stressors like that. So winners and losers. There's direct effects for calcium carbonate producers, things that make shells, mussels, clams, oysters, you know, they have to work a little bit harder metabolically to make a shell in a more acidic ocean. So that costs them more energy. But there's a bunch of indirect effects too, because there's there's some evidence that high CO2, just like with us, you know, I, I've done a lot of deep submersible diving and the older submersibles, you know, the CO2 levels in the submarine get, can get really high. And then we open up some sodium hydroxide canister and it, but as the CO2 level gets above about one and a half percent, like it completely affects your cognition and you get this funny headache and sometimes you start seeing spots, you know, that's a good sign. Well, the same thing happens in the ocean. There's fish that exhibit um, kind of loss of executive function. If you can think about fish being executive, but like, you know, they slow down a little bit and the second you slow down, somebody eats you, right? So, and that's been demonstrated in, ex in experiments. So those are indirect effects, um, loss of, you know, reduced reproductive success in penguins seems to go with high CO2 levels. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, we're just beginning to understand what those are and how they interact with the different stressors. Okay, good question. Yes, Peter. I had a little, uh, can you hear me in this? Yeah. I had some experience as a pet food uh, stock clerk, and we were selling diatomaceous earth. Oh, yeah. And I came to understand it's the little tiny shells of the diatom. So is that a calcium product? Yeah, animals? those are silicon dioxide. So, yeah, it got marketed as a product called Dicolite. They it got put into all kinds of things, including kitty litter. But, <laughs> but there, there was a lot of diatomaceous earth mining in like Utah, um, from freshwater deposits, but we have a ton of it here in California. There are huge diatomaceous deposits that are also our most important source beds for petroleum and gas. So that's not calcium carbonate, that's silicon dioxide. It's like the mineral opal. With is, is, this the same, is this the same kind of animals that are on the bottom of the ice in the- Yes diatoms yeah so it, do they have any ability to absorb carbon dioxide to be well as they're growing you know then their organic tissues are are absorbing or they convert um lick you know a dissolved co2 into solid organic matter at a precise ratio to nitrogen and phosphorus right so if you have a big diatom bloom um and then they sink to the bottom and they're pretty good at sinking because that those shells are pretty heavy. It's like ballast, right? Um, they sink to the bottom and that's pulled CO2 out of the surface waters, sequestered it into solid organic matter and then sent it down to the bottom. And, and if it's deep water, it could be out of the, out of contact with the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Burke? Yeah, I had a question about the, the fishing you were talking about, and especially the toothfish, yeah. the Antarctic and the uh, Patagonian. Is there any real difference between them other than scale and age in terms of the, well, the flavor? I mean, they, they appear, yeah, I think they both taste really good. <laughs> I've eaten both. I mean, I, you know, because when I'm in Antarctica, we, there's a team that comes down and fishes for the Antarctic toothfish at McMurdo Sound, 78 degrees south. And and uh, they have huge aquaria. And there's some fish that have been in the aquaria for 40 years. And they look just like they did 40 years ago, you know. But every now and then they sacrifice a fish. And then if you're friends with Art DeVries, then he'll invite you over to fish barbecue. And if you're best friend, you get to get the fish cheeks, which are apparently the best. 
And these fish have enormous cheeks too. Um, they are different species and they're not, you know, we don't know enough about breeding to, to be sure that they can't interbreed, but genetically they're really quite different. They look very similar on the outside. Um, I think there's a few taxonomists that if they can do a dissection can say Patagonian toothfish, Antarctic toothfish, and they do the populations um, co-occur in the Drake Passage region and around the Antarctic Peninsula. And that's a tough one because the, the British control access to the South Georgia Patagonian toothfish fishery, and it's extremely well managed and highly regulated. And if you buy Chilean sea bass in the UK or most of Europe, and it's come out through South Georgia, I think you can say it's a sustainable fish. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the transshipment and mixing of supply lines, you know, there are people injecting Antarctic toothfish into the supply lines as though it were Patagonian toothfish. And as far as we know, the Antarctic toothfish is not sustainable. But to get it into the market where they make more money, they'll figure out a way to make it appear as though it's Patagonian toothfish. So at this point, it's just the toothfish and the krill that are really commercial? Uh, well, you, yeah. I mean, there's whaling, right? So Japan still yeah. whales in the Southern Ocean. Norway stopped. Norway was the single biggest uh, killer of whales. They invented the explosive tipped um, whale harpoon, the whale guns, right? Um, and with their bases throughout the Southern Ocean, they killed hundreds of thousands of blue whales. <laughs> But they stopped, you know, they, they still whale in the Nordic seas, uh, Norwegians whale and um, natives of Greenland whale. Uh, I think there's some whaling in Iceland. Um, some Alaskan indigenous communities have limits and are allowed to whale. Uh, but Japan's the only one that I know of that's whaling in the Southern Ocean. And some years it's as many as 1300 pilot whales that they bring back and uh, supposedly for scientific study, but then once the whales are studied, then they're put into the food supply. So um, schools, elementary schools receive Antarctic whales for school lunches. Uh, you know how Japan's really big on those vending machines everywhere <laughs> with tons of plastic around everything, but there's whale vending machines now where you can get whale meat. Um, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Lou, Lou, do you have a, any questions? Uh, no, no, no questions in uh, from no the question. Go ahead. Okay. So, little Robert, and then over here. Um, can you talk about plastic in the ocean? My understanding is that that is a huge mess, I and mean, there's like huge gyres, thousands of square miles that yeah. have plastic all over the place. Well, you know, I mean, there's there is an awful lot of plastic in the ocean. And where I normally, um, yeah, Earth Day is coming up on April 22nd. The official theme um, for 2024 is planet versus plastics. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's all over the place. I, you know, the best plastic collectors out there are the world's beaches. And, you know, we go to these islands in Chagos where nobody's lived for 70 years. And um, there's, there's, there's plastic everywhere. Right. And some of my classes in Alaska, we do service learning, like we'll spend a day doing service work for the community. And one of the things they always ask us to do is, oh, would you mind cleaning up plastic on this beach? And we'll clean up two or three kilometers of Alaskan beach. And then we always categorize what we collected and then weigh it. And it's tons, right? Uh, two to three kilometers it's tons it's unbelievable but the, this notion of the great pacific plastic patch garbage patch you know i mean i've been through there many times on ships and and it's you know they have this image of it's so dense that you could walk across it it's not like that at all you have to tow a net to actually get it once in a while you'll see a fishing ball or a fishing net but the bulk of the plastic is small pieces. Uh, it, it dissolves, breaks down into its constituent plastic. Uh, it's called nerdle, N-E-R-D-L-E-S, nerdles, or that's how plastic is created. 
but it breaks back down into that. And if you tow a net, you'll get a lot of it, but you can't really see it with your eyes. And then what can we do in our own lives to reduce this plastic? Yeah, into the well, oil? yeah, I mean, you know, we've reduced our use of plastics a lot at home and, you know, pl we don't use plastic bags at the grocery store. Then voting for plastic interception systems and in aqueducts like City of L.A., it creates some problems during floods every now and then if they get clogged up. But, you know, they have these netting systems that are designed to trap plastics coming down the sloughs and, and waterways. Um, I'm not a, you know, there's a bunch of startup companies that want to send fleets of plastic collectors out in the ocean, but it, it, that takes a lot of energy. And to me, like the, the most efficient collectors are the beaches. So you're better off hiring local people to clean the beaches and prevent that plastic from returning to the sea. That's my solution there. And there's a bunch of companies doing that as well, and they work pretty well. It supports locals and it doesn't use a bunch of energy. Um, it looks like there are a number of nations, they even look like when you're when your graphic of big fishing nations, big who don't want to sign these treaties. They don't want to be required to live by the consequences of the treaty. So it doesn't sound like there's an enforcement mechanism. Um, how is it going to work? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that'll be the big challenge for the, the port state measures, you know, that's, that was an amazing innovation, right? To just, you know, you don't go after the fishing boats, you go after the ports where they want to land their catch because there's a much smaller number of ports for landing compared to the fishing boats. But they will have to, um, you know, the, the High Seas Treaty that includes ostensibly legally binding instruments, there'll be penalties assessed if countries are illegally fishing. Um, there'll be penalties assessed if certain countries' fishing fleets are intruding into no-take zones and marine protected areas. But, you know, what does that mean? Are they going to be financially penalized? Do they lose a preferred trading status as a pretty good stick? Um, do they lose access but, to... But Japan is up there at the top. Russia is up yeah. there at the top. i got to believe they're not going to enforce the ports treaty. Well, you know, Japan... Um, you know, they absolutely want to maintain security ties with the U.S., right? And so geopolitics, just like the case of Ukraine in 2014, abandoning their, you know, they were saying, we'll never sign this. You know, we're a small country, but we're punching way above our weight in terms of Southern Ocean fish take. And the second they wanted to help against Russia, then, oh, we're going to vote with the U.K. and um, so that kind of soft power of political alignment, security alignment is a little bit less soft. You know, the, the smart diplomats know how to use that and turn it into action. But but in another sense, you're absolutely right. Like a lot of people are scratching their heads saying, how is this going to work? How are we going to stop, you know, China, I think, as the world's largest fishing fleet and its global an extent and there's horrific conditions on some of these boats where sailors are basically held captive out on small boats for two years and they they simply go to mother ships offload their catch pick up fuel and a little bit of food and then are sent back out again and that's happening in every ocean on the planet um they're you know they're also greatly accelerating their freshwater aquaculture right and fish like tilapia, um, which is a, a really good thing for them to be doing. But the question is, you know, are they going to always be a thorn in the side of international uh, protection mechanisms? And my guess is yes, for some time to come, because they have such a huge population to feed. Everybody wants fish. China has a bunch of interesting food security issues, right? Because their terrestrial grain production, you know, it's not spread out across all of China. It's a surprisingly small area of high efficiency production, like in our central plains regions for wheat and corn. But 
but it's also the part of China that's warming up the fastest, right? And the notion is that, you know, it won't be that many more decades to where people can't really work outside in the summer, just too hot. So, um, yeah, they're working pretty hard on a more sustainable food system. What they're doing now with high seas fishing is not sustainable. But they signed, you know, they, I mean, they haven't ratified, but they signed the high seas treaty. Oh. No, no, I, yeah. Nor does it mean the U.S. will, because we haven't ratified anything. Should we ratify? There's a great decision. <laughs> There's probably a good question on which day, and I have a whole bunch more. <laughs> uh, but we have reached the yes. designated end uh, of the time commitment we asked for. You have fulfilled expectations and the task of talking about the oceans magnificently. Everybody will go home from this both smarter about oceans and I trust with questions that they want to Google um, that uh, it's opened up lots yeah. of areas to think about. So Rob, thank you so much, Robin. Thank you for coming and being a part of us. <laughs> Thanks to everybody online and here. Next week is the final session of this year's Great Decisions program. It's on preparing for the next pandemic. Ooh. Our speaker is Philip Zellico, who I've worked with in several capacities inside and outside of government. But he's speaking because he was on the group that did a University of Virginia study of lessons to be learned from how we mishandled COVID. And uh, Philip is always interesting and usually provocative. So please put this on your calendar for, for next week. And Rob, again, thank you so much for sharing your thank slides you. and your knowledge. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and then stop the session. Uh, thanks very much as usual. The recording will be available uh, around midweek and you will get an email uh, announcing that it's availability. Thanks again. Appreciated uh, all your insights, Rob. Uh, and uh, everybody have a great rest of uh, this evening and a great week.